Peter. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, Peter. I really appreciate it, and uh, look forward to a great conversation. You know, uh, I'm here to tell you something that you may or may not know, but I'm going to say it anyway. Innovation of technology is actually the easy part of creating a billion dollar business. Now that sounds counterintuitive because as an engineer myself, you know, we all tend to get excited about the breakthrough inventions and then what you know, come from that in terms of innovation. But I will tell you, you can have the coolest, greatest product um, if the timing isn't right or your go to market isn't right or you're not well funded, you will not translate that into a billion dollar business. So, uh, I'm going to work from the assumption that you know, there is lots of talent and there's lots of brain power and will continue to be around for many years to come that will innovate great products. The key question I'm going to talk to you about today is how do, we turn, how do you turn those into successful billion dollar businesses? Now I'm an entrepreneur myself and from what Peter told me there's quite a few entrepreneurs in the room here. I'd like to ask a quick question. Who of you have created a successful billion dollar business? Grew something from nothing to a billion dollars? Okay, I always ask that question. And even if I'm in front of a group of uh, CS, C, you know, 500 CXOs, maybe one or two hands will go up. Uh, who has been associated or has been part of a company that went from nothing to a billion? A few more folks in the room. Okay, great. So, you know, this is not an easy problem, and few people actually in their career get the opportunity to go through that. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we do that at Cisco. Um, first of all, you know, at Cisco, innovation is key to our culture. Each one of our employees walk around with a badge uh, that, you know, really has one of the key aspects of our culture, uh, you know, innovation. Cisco, of course, uh, has been a playing a, a key part in building the internet. Our products are used 80% of the, you can think of it, 80% of the fabric of the internet is made up of Cisco's products, routers, switches, et cetera. And so it's been a, a great culture. I've been there for almost 15 years. I was not acquired. I was hired into the first acquisition Cisco made. Uh, you know, and I've seen the company go from 3,000 people when I joined to about uh, 67,000 people today from less than a billion in revenues to now almost 40 billion in revenues. And it's been fascinating to see how we've done that. Uh, we have an interesting innovation model. Uh, we're very good at building products. We spend about five plus billion a year in research and development. So we, we, we're great at doing the incremental uh, line extensions or incremental innovations. But we are also not proud or too proud about what we've built. So if you know, what we're doing is not good enough or fast enough. We'll go out and buy what we don't have or what we need. And we have done close to 150 acquisitions. And I think we're well known for, uh, you know, uh, being very, very good at not just acquiring companies, but retaining the talent and the brain uh, power of, of who we acquire. We tend to partner extensively with, with technology partners, go to market partners, and with our customers. And, you know, key to our innovation model is collaboration. We have a very collaborative culture. It doesn't mind, it doesn't matter who you work for, uh, it's who you work with that really matters. And so you'll see that the way we're organized today is, you know, um, I wear many hats. I run the Emerging Technologies Group, but I'm also the chair of Cisco Smart Grid Board. I chair the Video Council and, you know, about four or five others. I'm also on the Development Council, which is five executives that run all of Cisco's research and development. So, you know, being able to collaborate is inherently important if you want to be successful at a company like Cisco. Uh, and so you have the hard organizational structures, but then you have the loose structures that run across the organizations that is centered around how you move into market adjacencies of key, or key, uh, core initiatives. Now, over the last number of years, my team and I have really become students of the innovation game. Because I, in my past uh, life, uh, actually was, have been CEO of two startup companies that I started with no venture capital, but mortgaging my house because I grew up in South Africa and there was, no, <laughs> there was no venture money available. But over a seven year period, I ran two startups myself. I will tell you though that it is harder 
to do a startup within a big company than it is to do a startup outside of a big company. Because you have a lot of more degrees of freedom when you're you know, a small startup. It's also harder, of course, in many aspects because you don't get to leverage the big company uh, complementary assets. But you know, fighting the antibodies, as I like to call it, inside of the big organization often makes it much, much harder. And The Innovator's Dilemma is a great book that described that uh, in spades. So when we started down this track four or five years ago, I was you know, asked by John to, uh, at, at the time I was running the enterprise voice business. I grew that from nothing to yeah. about 700 million for the company. I had 1,500 engineers working for me. And I was asked to go do two new startups <coughs> for the company. And my first answer was, sure, I'll get right on it. And John said, no, 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 uh, that's all you're going to do. And I want you to take two people to begin with. And, I, and it's actually not John, it was John and Charlie. And I looked at Charlie, my boss at the time, and I said, Charlie, you're firing me, right? Just come out and say it. Don't beat around the bush. And he said, no, 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 we're very serious about this. So uh, we, I recognized very early on that uh, we, I cannot do this myself. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I need a lot of smart people in the room. But then I also need to find a way to leverage thousands of very, very smart people around the world to bring the ideas to the table, to find the best ideas, and then to go make those successful businesses. And that you know, really summarizes what we do in my group. Um, the way we continue to innovate in existing markets with the existing technologies is through internal development and acquisition. We move into new markets through partnerships or acquisition, as well as into new technology areas. But in order to get into new market adjacencies, these are markets you do not participate in today. And when I say markets, uh, it's really technology markets. Uh, so areas like you know, video collaboration that we were not in three years ago. Uh, with a series of brand new innovative technologies is best done through internal venture. And this is what the smart guys at MIT will tell you. So there's many examples that prove out this point. And if you do it right, then creating a win-win with your existing businesses becomes really important. So that you, f you first of all get to leverage the complementary assets of the company, the brand, the channel, the sales team, etc. But you also get an architectural integration point that becomes very important for long-term sustainable differentiation. Our telepresence just simply works better when it runs on a Cisco IP network than anyone else's endpoints. And that becomes a long-term sustainable differentiation because you can call anyone across a multitude of geographies with telepresence. And that's not an easy problem to solve. So finding that and ensuring that is important. Now, when we set out on this journey, really two and a half, three years ago, uh, we set a goal to add six and a half billion within five to seven years uh, to the company's top line. Now, that was a pretty audacious goal. And the way we would get there is if you work the, the math backwards, is we would need about a thousand prospects in order to fund about 20 new businesses. That's not unlike the startup world where you know, only 2% of ideas that gets pitched actually get funded. But what is fundamentally different is out of the 20 ideas that we are pursuing, we expect 75% or three out of four to actually succeed, to become successful billion dollar profitable businesses. Now that's much higher than the startup world where it's typically about 10% of that 2% that get funded that actually become successful businesses. And I'm not even counting billion dollar businesses, that's just successful businesses. So that is a very, very high bar. Now you may ask, gosh, you know, uh, how are you gonna do that? Um, and the key is that I'm not just another startup outside in the big world. I do get to leverage the complementary assets of a great company. And if I can rally the rest of the company around these new businesses, then I get access to those complementary assets. And that's key because if you have the bright new shiny thing, but you're two million in revenues this year, and you go to the head of sales and say, can you please invest $10 million in this $2 million business next year? He looks at you and he goes, well, hang on a second. 
this business over here brings two billion, and you want me to invest 10 million in a two million business? You know, if I take that 10 million and I invest it over here in this two billion dollar business, guess what? I'm probably going to get a 200 million dollar return, right? And that's the hard part: is to really ensure that you can rally people inside the company in order to get there. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So we have defined a venture framework, I'll show you in a moment here, that enables and facilitates a repeatable process to take anything from an idea to a billion dollar business. And the first function in that framework is the find function. And we have effectively leveraged Web 2.0 technology and the wisdom of the crowd out there, and that could be Cisco employees, it could also be a broader crowd, in order to get access to the best and brightest business ideas. So the internal wiki is called iZone. This is our idea wiki. And we launched it about two years ago. Uh, we now have more than 2,000 billion dollar business ideas in iZone. Now you may say, gosh, you know, you are only looking for 1,000, right? And the answer is yes, I never thought I could get a thousand. But once we facilitated inputs from people around the company that could not just input those ideas, but others could see it and they could you know, vote on it, they could um, add to it. Uh, and suddenly people started collaborating from all over the world around these ideas and the ideas became better and better. This has been a great source of billion dollar business ideas for us. We've also gone external. And we facilitated, not unlike what iPrize or XPrize is doing, we called ours iPrize, and it was really an open innovation model, not unlike what we've done internally with iZone, but turned inside out. Now you can, Im you can imagine the debates inside of the company around you know, loss of intellectual property you know, and, and all of those issues that always come about with that. But we were able to successfully show the rest of Cisco that the reward we would get from an open innovation model would be far greater than the risk of potential intellectual property leak. And sure, there will be intellectual property leak, but again, the value of what we will get of that open innovation model is far, far greater. So we, we've successfully run our first contest. We will do a series two and, and three and so forth. And uh, we effectively had a prize of $250,000, nothing like the X prize. But um, the winning team got $250,000. We invest $10 million to develop that into a real business. Those founders have the potential to be a part of the company. And we've leveraged our own internal technology to facilitate the process. So we've had the you know, iPrize uh, wiki that people started with. We then gave them private WebEx collaboration rooms once they formed a team to go develop those ideas further. We then interviewed the finalists on Telepresence, and many of them met for the first time on Telepresence you know, as we brought them together. Because uh, they were, with, almost without exception, the members of every team came from different countries all over the world. Uh, in fact, the winning team had two people from Germany and one person from Russia that made up the, the winning team. And now we have formed a, a new business unit around the winner, which was, in fact, Smart Grid. Now, you may say, gosh, you know, Smart Grid is everywhere today. That's true, but two years ago, there was little or no talk of Smart Grid, and what the winning team really did for us was an idea as to how Cisco could play a pivotal role in the transformation of electrical grids. And I'll tell you, two years ago, if you, know, you asked anyone inside of Cisco, how could Cisco play a role in transforming how electrons get routed to deliver energy versus bits and bytes with pieces of information that we route around the internet today, I don't think you would have had many positive answers. But today, it's one of the hottest areas in the company. So this was sort of the quick, uh, you know, we launched it in October of 07. We'd had 2,500 participants from 104 countries. They came up with 1,200 additional billion dollar business ideas. Uh, we then, you know, formed, we picked 32 teams that were sort of the top contenders. We, in, this, in, the, in the final uh, round, uh, withered it down to 12 teams. And, you know, Team AKS won the contest. We left it wide open. We had a few guidelines around, you know, it has to be an adjacency that would make sense for Cisco to get into. 
And we wanted it to be a viable, you know, it, it needed to have the potential to become a viable billion dollar business. You know, and I will tell you though, <laughs> you know, not all these ideas were good ideas. I mean, there were some really bad ideas that came in as well. But that's okay, you know, you, read, you need the really bad ones in order to get the really good ones. I think the worst one I saw was someone proposing that we go into the business of providing buried mailboxes for people's homes. Now, I don't know, but I couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> Maybe you can. <laughs> All right. This is the framework I alluded to earlier. We have established, and this is a very high level view of it, but we've established an internal venture framework to take something from an idea to a successful business. So I've just talked to you a little bit about the processes we use to find billion dollar business ideas. But we then have a second series of processes as to how we filter and shape those ideas to find the really, really good ones. And one of the most important ones we have is every quarter we have a leadership training program where we bring executives from all over the world together and we ask them to wear a general manager hat and we give them these ideas with basic research that's been done to that point in a basic business model and we ask them to go develop the ideas further and come back at the end of their six month, their six month uh, uh, you know, training class and, and you know, tell us why we should be in this business. We have top faculty from top universities facilitating the, the six month program. I'm sorry, the six week program. And it is fascinating to see the result. And this, remember I said before that I cannot do this if I don't have the interest or support from the rest of the company. Well, other than it being a good intellectual exercise for these executives, we have seen time and time again, by the time they come back and they provide me that readout of why we should be in this business, they became so passionate about this new business opportunity for Cisco that they literally would call me on a weekly basis and ask me, have you funded this yet? Have you funded this yet? Um, and they will constantly tell me, when you do, please let me know because I want to be a part of it. So immediately I have a large group of up and coming leaders that has participated in the creation of this business. They feel ownership, they're passionate about it. So by the time I actually fund one of these businesses, I have a lot of permission around the company to go do that. And I also have people very passionately oriented to go help me be successful. And you cannot underestimate, no matter how good your idea is, you cannot underestimate the, the support you need, the broader support you need outside of your sphere of influence in order to make an idea a billion dollar business. You cannot do it without that. So how you leverage the wisdom of the crowd, how you then facilitate mass collaboration, and how you mobilize the key stakeholders, in my case, you know, the, ex the rest of the executive team around a new business is fundamental to success. And we live in an era where Web 2.0 technology and the internet and the connectedness of our, you know, daily lives these days enable us to do that. That was, by the way, that was not possible 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So the world has changed and, and uh, we can do things now we couldn't do before. Then after we the best ideas, you know, we decide to proceed on. And by the way, by the time I decide to fund, it's not a surprise to anyone. People are sort of telling me, why haven't you done it yet? Uh, we then go into a mode where I ha hire a few key founders. Some come from within the company, some come from outside, depending on the business opportunity we're looking at. And we then do the final validation to understand, you know, is this feasible? Is the timing right? Uh, is there not a technology assumption in here that just isn't realistic. You know, all of those basic questions, we revalidate those. And then I initiate the formation of this business unit. We rapidly develop the technology. And when I say rapidly, I mean rapidly. Just to give you a quick uh, sample of this, the telepresence solution was developed by an average of 35 people over a 18 month period. That solution uh, today was, well, it was one of the first 1080p solutions on the market, bar none, meaning even your set-top box, we had 1080p well about a year before you could get 1080p from a Comcast or others. And we were able to deliver full 1080p high-definition video in about 2 megabits per second, which was when we started the project, the best you could find was about 30 megabits per second. 
So it was more of an order of magnitude of improvement needed. And if you look at the integration of the hardware and software we've done, just to give you an idea, the amount of MIPS we run in every telepresence room is about 500 MIPS, the equivalent of you know, just a small supercomputer of just a few years ago, uh, uh, you know, with about 10 plus million lines of code to, to deliver that great experience. And that was done by 35 people in 18 months. And so it's truly innovative startup-like performance because we pick the, only the best and the brightest. We then go to market in a very accelerated manner. Meaning, and this is by the way, this is in my view, the, the most secret of the secret sauce, if you will, that makes this successful, which is how we go to market. Often startups would try to be all things to all people, day one. You know, I have this great new innovation and anyone that wants to use it, the answer is yes, go ahead. The problem is that in version 1.0 of anything, you can never be all things to all people. And if you try to do that, you will get, you know, a couple of customers in every market segment, but you'll get no advocates and you'll frustrate each one of those customers because they have a long list of features they will want from you and each customer segment will look you know, slightly different. So the better way to go about it is a very focused go-to-market approach where you pick, as per Jeffrey Moore's theory, which we've absolutely put in practice and it works, you, know, you pick your bowling alley, you pick your head pin and then two next pins. And these are typically you know, customer segments in specific geographies. So it would be you know, global finance in North America, could be a head pin for you, for instance. And you go after that, you pick your top 10 to 15 lighthouse accounts that are must wins. You win those accounts, they deploy it pervasively. They become great advocates. They tell everyone else in that segment, they go. And then you go to maybe the insurance industry that's adjacent to that that look towards global finance as to what technologies they use and that becomes a second pin. So that's you know, how we go to market in a very methodical way. Again, with small teams, very, go to mar very focused, year one and year two is not about revenues. It is about growth and it is about winning those lighthouse accounts. Uh, and then after a couple of years in the market, a business either graduates, meaning it's crossed the chasm. You've got three, four, five, major segments knocked over. Uh, you're well on your way to a billion. Telepresence is about to graduate. It's, it's, uh, I can't tell you because we're about to announce our results, but it's doing very well. It's well on its way to a billion uh, with very healthy margins. Or if a business is not making it, it's very important to rapidly repurpose and realign. Make sense? Okay, I've covered probably a week's long worth of theory in, in you know, five minutes, so I apologize for that. But there's a lot under each one of these steps that we've developed in order to you know, uh, really get this right. All right, now just in terms of results, this is sort of a snapshot of the businesses we've created. We have created nine businesses to date. One has failed, uh, or what we've repurposed, I should say, and you know, it really has not uh, made, made, made its mark. It probably would have been a successful $100 million business, but that's not what we were looking for. Um, and eight of them, you know, is, is well on their way to a billion. You can see, I won't go through all of them. Smart Grid is one of the newest ones we've just announced this last quarter, as well as Converse Building Systems, which is the smart energy management within buildings, within commercial and, and uh, office buildings. And then there's many more in the pipeline that we're busy developing. And then lastly, uh, you know, Cisco as a company, John, I, I, I'm very fortunate to work for one of, I think, the greatest CEOs in the world, certainly one of the greatest ones in high tech, and that's John Chambers. He is a true visionary. I'll tell you a quick story. You know, uh, even though John comes from a sales background, uh, you know, he has the ability to see the application of technology to what it can mean for customers better than anyone I've ever met. And when I first showed him telepresence, you know, uh, the first five minutes, we, we, we took him, I'll tell you two stories on telepresence. You'll hopefully will enjoy these. I called John up and I said, John, I've got this cool new prototype I want to show you. So it took me about six weeks to get a half an hour out of him. And uh, he came over. We had two rooms set up back to back. He went and sat down in one and I was in the other. For the first five minutes, I was 
talking to him you know, on telepresence, telling him about how the spatial audio works and how what 1080p high def is all about, and et cetera, et cetera. And for five minutes, he didn't say a word. And I got really worried because you know, maybe he was not buying this. <laughs> and so after five minutes, I stopped and I said, so John, you know, wh what do you think? And he says, Martin, this will transform how business is done. And today, that's what our customers are telling us. They are telling us that this is transforming the way business is done. Let me give you a few data points. We have more than 400 customers today. We've deployed more than 2,600 systems worldwide. And that's outside of Cisco. We are the first and best user. And by the way, that's an important aspect. If you ever develop or build any product, you be, need to be the first and best user. We like to say you need to eat your own dog food. There's nothing more that gives you more credibility than eating your own dog food with, with your customers. We have 530 rooms deployed ourselves worldwide. We do 5,000 meetings a week around the world. We're in 124 countries, and uh, we have about 2 million participants, Cisco employees participating in telepresence meetings every quarter. We have saved $270 million over the last two and a half years since we started rolling out, and we just started with 10 rooms initially, in just pure travel avoidance. We estimate that we've saved an additional 150 million in pure productivity savings, where people didn't have to spend time you know, schlepping bags through airports and, and so forth. Um, and we have, uh, we have, we believe, at least reduced our carbon footprint by 150 million uh, uh, cubic meters of CO2. So, not, so just to give you an idea, our run rate for travel spend has gone from 750 million down to 240 million as a company. And we haven't, we've done very limited restructuring over the last year, but our headcount has effectively been growing over that period of time. And so, you know, that, that's a true testimony of how it has transformed our business. Not only that, uh, you know, I tend to be, I have the fastest corporate jet of anyone. I can be in eight countries in one day and still be home tonight uh, with telepresence because I, that's how I meet now with customers. And it's made me a lot more productive. It's given me time back. One last quick story on telepresence, and I'm almost out of my 30 minutes here, but um, our previous president, George W. Bush, visited Cisco back in, gosh, it was... 2005, if I recall. And we didn't have, no, it was, maybe it was 2004. Yeah, I think it was 2004. We didn't even have a working prototype. Let me just put it that way. It was about two weeks after I showed John, <laughs> you know, the, the, amongst those two rooms. And John said, we want to show the president this when he's on campus. He, was, he, he came by and spoke about education. Well, my team scrambled like you cannot believe. And uh, we had two rooms set up. Of course, we had to work with his advanced team that came in, you know, all the high security stuff they had to check out. It was two pre-set up rooms. But when we were, uh, I was on the one side, and uh, the governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, was there with the president and John in the second room. And we were going to talk for about five minutes explaining the, uh, you know, the technology to him. Now, you've got to realize, I came to the U.S. about 15 years ago. I became a U.S. citizen a month before the president's visit, all right? So it was a really interesting time for me personally. But uh, we could not, we did, the technology wasn't at the point where we, you could actually use the phone in the room to place a call. So the team devised this really high-tech device. Uh, it was a piece of cardboard that we put over the lens because the call was actually up the previous night before the president arrived. But we had this piece of black cardboard over the lenses on my side of the room. And I had a, a piece of fishing line attached to this cardboard. <laughs> so I was sitting in the room, and when, when I, you know, as I got the thumbs up from the door, the president is in place, I yanked that line and pulled the piece of cardboard <laughs> off the cameras, and voila, we were sitting in front of the president of the United States. And uh, that was a pretty interesting experience. We ended up having a 15-minute conversation. Uh, Arnold made a comment. He said, you know, I've been in Hollywood all my life. This is the best experience on television I've ever seen, which was a cool comment. 
Uh, and then as we walked out, the president grabbed me by the arm and he said, Martin, I hear you just became a citizen. I said, yes, Mr. President. He says, let's go take a picture. And he started <laughs> walking off towards a, you know, a tall uh, flagpole. Of course, the, you know, the, the Secret Service was scrambling because this was not part of the plan, right? He was supposed to go on stage next. So anyway, we stood up, you know, took the picture, and he turned to me and he said, Martin, isn't it great to be a United States citizen? And I said, yes, Mr. President, it's great to be a United States citizen. So that was a cool, uh, probably the coolest experience of my life. Um, now, uh, I'll end there, but let me just go back to this, because I started with John when I put up the slide, because I'll tell you, John constantly pushed us to think outside the box. And as a company, we have desires to go from you know, 40 billion in revenues today to 100 and, or more, and effectively be the best company in the world and the best company <coughs> for the world. That is our ultimate vision and mission as a company. And the way we're going to do it is not just focused on our existing businesses, but also on a set of adjacencies. Those adjacencies could be something like China 3.0. We call it China 3.0, which is you know, how we move into that geography. But it could also be smart grid, right? Or it could be how we operate more green as a company. And so we have boards and councils, which are those soft structures I mentioned, set up around these key initiatives or market adjacencies for Cisco. And these executives come together and drive these initiatives forward. We have working groups reporting into those boards and councils that again has employees from a very variety of organizations that drive these forward on a daily basis. And uh, you know, we've got 30 today. I think he added the last one just two weeks ago. But it's going to go to 50. He already has warned us. So you know, uh, many companies have three to five top priorities. We have 30 going to 50. And the only way you can do that is to not just have the top 10 people run any company, but the top 500 going to the top 3,000. And we do it through this board and council structure. The rest of the world is starting to notice. Uh, there's, you know, I recently, just last week, did some interviews was it with Forbes and the Wall Street Journal. And I think, you know, hopefully there will be, if we're successful as this, there will be a Harvard Business Case Studies written. Because uh, this is a brand new way to manage, and it's a brand new way to involve many more people around the company to get great things done. So I'll leave you with that and, you know, any questions? Ah, that's, that's great, Martin. And I, I am uh, really extremely pleased how apropos that is to the team project and the work that you're doing. And you can see the similarities clearly in what you've been doing over the last few weeks. Uh, love to have a conversation between the students and, uh, and Martin, of course, the faculty members as well. Thanks. So my question, okay, so my name is Shauna. I'm from Canada, uh, background medicine, neuroscience, space mm -hmm. studies. Um, so my question um, is about the level of user satisfaction with not being able to be in the same room. Do you, um, have you found that to be a concern with your customers and how have you addressed that? That's a great question. You know, uh, high definition, in particular 1080p, because even 720p, which is basic HD, is not good enough. You need to get the technology to a point where you can build a trust relationship without being in the same room. Video conferencing never really took off. People use it 6% of the time, even when they buy it, because the technology was hard to use, and it just did not deliver a good experience. With telepresence, we're seeing 60% utilization rates across an eight-hour day. And uh, I, I've hired two VPs that I've never met. I actually met them after I've hired them, one in, in India. And I have a long-distance trust relationship with that executive on telepresence. So it's multiple things. It is the ability to see the expression in your eyes. Or when I ask you that tough question, do you blush, do you flinch, do you sweat? Okay. The technology has to be that good. The person across the table, the virtual table, is in full life-size, ultra-high definition. The audio is full wide band and it's fully spatial. So the person that sits over there, their voice come from where they sit. The person over here, voice come from where they sit. So we fool the human brain into forgetting about the technology and truly feeling like that person is in the room. And that's what's made telepresence such a, a winner for us. But you know, 60, the other thing is I would say 60% of any communication experience is visual in nature. Our brains are wired for visual inputs. In fact, as much as two, 
two-thirds of the cortex of the brain is dedicated to visual inputs, and the processing of visual inputs. So if you can capture not just the audio, but everything else when someone communicates with you in a meeting, uh, and it's good enough, you can build that trust relationship and, and then you know, people feel, feel good about it. And we're seeing people now having all-day meetings uh, across our rooms, and they will tell us uh, constantly that they forget about the technology after the first five minutes, and it feels like they were in the same room. I think one of the areas, if I look out into the future, uh, you know, because of climate change, we have to all think fundamentally differently about how we work, live, play, and learn. And I think these types of technologies that can truly bring transformational experiences, uh, not just to make us more productive, but in the process help us address some of you know, the greatest challenges the world may face in the future, to me is really, really exciting. And I think this is just the meeting experience and the business relationship is just one experience we can transform through technology. Uh, Luke Hutchison, PhD candidate in computer science at MIT. I'm just wondering uh, what your opinion is on how large companies can avoid getting bogged down in their own inertia. So, you know, companies like Google are dealing with this right now as they sort of reach this critical point. What is Cisco, Cisco doing to avoid the problems that come from that? Oh, that's a, that's a big one because I think John would always tell you that uh, no company becomes a great company until they've been shaken to their core. It happened with GE, you know, Jack Welch will tell you that. Uh, it happened with, you know, with, with Cisco. The dot-com bust in 2001 knocked us on our rear. But, you know, we got right back up and that really gave us the identity we have today. And it also made us realize how, uh, you know, not to take anything away from Google, but, you know, you have to have a repeatable process and a, a sustainable differentiation in anything and everything you do. And I think Google as a very young company is going through that right now. They, they're still trying to find who they really are, what their core is, and how are they going to expand from that in order to sustain growth. Because it's all about sustainable growth. A monolithic business can never give you sustainable growth because every business goes through a life cycle of you know, pre-chasm, post-chasm, high growth, then it matures, right? And you need additional waves of businesses to come in that's going to keep your company growing. And you know, that's effectively what we've done and what we've went through since 01. And it's worked for us. If you think back of 01, the biggest fundamental change we've made was we, we went down this path of uh, creating what we called advanced technologies. Our entry into voice over IP, wireless, security were all examples of that. And these were all new upcoming uh, businesses that created high growth for us and not just helped us recover, but you know, also helped our core business recover and then gave us additional growth over time. Neil Thompson, I'm a PhD student at the House School of Business, Berkeley. And my question is, as you launch these new enterprises, what is your uh, relationship like with the other business units where many of the people you're probably choosing to lead them are probably also their best and brightest? You know, that's, that's always a, an interesting dilemma. But I'm very fortunate to work with an excellent leadership team at Cisco that realize, and the really good ones realize that, you know, people uh, need to continue to be challenged and get new opportunities. And so, you know, if, if, a, if a key leader has been in a role for three, four, five years, and you don't get them a new challenge, they will end up leaving all the, all, or they'll get frustrated. And so we have, you know, uh, we have a lot of permission around the company to give people additional career uh, opportunities. You know, I personally will tell you that I, I have on multiple occasions paid some of my direct reports bigger bonuses than what I have earned because, you know, I thought they were worth it. My, my boss probably didn't at the time. But, <laughs> but, you know, I have no problem with someone becoming a peer that today, for instance, is working for me. Uh, and hiring people that are much smarter than me is also, I'm very, very comfortable with that. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's not about me, it's about my, my team and what we can do together. So that attitude, first of all, attract people. That mindset, people see that. I mean, I have people that worked for me, left, worked somewhere else for two, three years, and now is working for me again as I form some of these new startups. And just when people feel that, one, you're gonna support them in terms of their growth, and two, you, you know, you're going to 
uh, if they want to go do something else, they have the permission to go do that. In fact, she will tell you at my two, my, uh, six months ago, one of my all hands meetings, I told my entire staff, and I had the executives in the front row, their eyes went like this when I said this. I said to the engineers, I said, look, if you don't enjoy what you're working on today, you need to go find another job. Because you are frustrated and you're not bringing the value you can bring to this team. You know, and just me saying that, giving everyone permission to know that I understand they're here out of their own free will and that we're going to support them if they want to go do something else because one day they may come back. It's that kind of culture that I think is very important to foster in any organization. But it is sometimes, you know, there's people that will get a little bit twerked or tweaked if you take their top performer or their top executive. But at the end of the day, people understand and they do what's right for the business. Uh, my name is Jose, I come from Venezuela and I work on energy issues. And my question is about energy. Mm -hmm. A few weeks ago we had Bob Metcalf here talking about f going from internet to internet. And he said that this was the most fundamental change that we could see and also that energy should be free like internet. So you were talking about the smart grid. So what is your view about the internet and a free energy supply system for the whole planet? Thank you. That's a fascinating uh, area, of course, that we've gotten really, really excited about the last two years. I not only co or chair the Smart Grid Board, but I also have a business unit that's actually bus building a big solution in the space. I will just tell you from Cisco's point of view, we think this opportunity is as big or bigger than the internet for our company. <laughs> it is huge. Just a couple data points. There are 100 times more homes connected to grids, electrical grids, than there are computers connected to the internet today. Wow. So we just need to connect 1% and it will be as big as the internet, theoretically, all right? The other thing that's really fascinating is uh, energy is what makes the world go around. You know, in the modern world, I mean, even in the undeveloped world, right, energy, whether it's from a fire to cook or whatever the case is, right, it's a basic, basic need. And so uh, thirdly, there has been little to no innovation in this space. Uh, fourthly, the world is running out of energy. You know, the population growth and everything around that is demanding, putting much, much greater demands. And because for 50 years the grid fundamentally didn't evolve, it's running out of capacity. And when you look at utilities, you know, 80% of their cost goes in when they hit those peaks, that is about 5% of the time. And they, have, they incur massive costs when they hit those peaks. So on top of that, and that's already happening today, on top of that, you've got all these new consumers of energy, whether it's electric cars, on and on, and you've got new sources of supply, you know, whether it's solar, wind, turbine, you know, thermal, it's geothermal, it's, et cetera. And so how you actually match the needs uh, or the demands to the supply is going to be require a very sophisticated um, network to route electrons from the right source to the right destination. Sounds a lot like routing bits and bytes from the right source to the right destination. In fact, I had a meeting with uh, Southern Cal Edison last week, their head of technology, and he was talking about how they're starting to build rings that are self-healing in the grid. And if a specific ground fault occurs, <coughs> They can, in, in basically milliseconds, beat the breakers to isolate that segment and reform the ring. Sounds a lot like you know, routing protocols and how we built the internet. So there's a, there's a ton of analogy. It's a very big problem. It's here to stay. And today, you, know, you have all these small networks, if you will, or small pieces of grids. You know, in the U US, there's more than 30,000 utilities, just to give you an idea, electric utilities. And so those things will all become connected as they need to tap into alternative sources of energy and so forth. Uh, so I can go on and on, but I will just say this is a very big opportunity. It's here to stay. We are going to play a very, very big part of it uh, in, in three areas. Uh, think of a control uh, network that's going to route those electrons. That is, it will be parallel to the actual grid, you know, the, the wires that carry the electricity. That's a brand new network that will get built out and will extend into every home. I believe a second broadband connection into every home. I can go into why, but 
basically, if your 17-year-old runs your home network, you understand why. You need a separate connection, right? Um, and then secondly, in the home, there's, there's a whole big market there for in-home uh, you know, energy management. We're working with partners like GE and others. And then in building, meaning office and commercial buildings, we already have a solution for that as to how you connect all of your building systems to the, to the uh, 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 in-building network. And then in the future, as grids become smarter and they can signal price, prices to buildings and homes, you know, that system needs to automatically respond to your policies uh, and do different things at different times of the day based on the pricing signals they get from the grid. So, you know, the whole automation of electrical distribution, the management of that, and then, you know, making the world a greener place overall is massive. One last data point, Google, NetApps, Walgreens are all customers of ours for the in-building energy systems. And in all cases, just after, the, after tying their building systems together, their air conditioning, lighting, et cetera, they are immediately seeing a 25% reduction in energy use across those buildings, just applying policies and making these systems talk to each other. So, you know, the, the, this, this is a green field. There's so much opportunity we're really excited about. Martin, thank you so very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.